Welcome back to React Native Radio Podcast. Brought to you by Flutter 2.0, twice the framework you'll never use. Episode 191, Advancements in Expo with Brent Batney. Hey everyone, welcome to the React Native Radio Podcast, where we explore React Native together. I'm your host, founder and CTO of Infinite Red, Jamin Holmgren. I am located in Vancouver in Southwest Washington State. I'm on the React Native core team and also primary maintainer of MobX State Tree. I'm joined by my Mokova co-hosts, Robin, <laughs> not Harris, not Haditi. Unfortunately, they didn't make it, but I did bring in a guest co-host, Brian Stearns. I'll introduce him in a second. Mokova. First, w- uh, yeah, I need you to back up and, and define what you just called me. <laughs> <laughs> Mokova, I am learning Finnish. I am learning Finnish, and Mokova means nice, kind, etc. Uh, Mokova is, uh, I, I like the word. I like saying the word Mokova. It sounds really cool. So if I said, you know, Sina Olet Mokova, that means you are nice. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> The person speaking there was Robin Heights. She is a senior software engineer. She is located in Portland, Oregon, and works at Infinite Red. She specializes in React Native and podcasting. What is up, Robin? Oh, not much, Jamin. Just waiting for the incoming blizzard, they say, is coming. Right? <laughs> yeah, we are supposed to get hit really hard. They canceled school already without a single flake hitting the ground. You know, it's, they're pretty sure it's going to be bad if they do that. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to get bad. The kids are excited, though. Also joining us today is Brian Stearns. He is going to guest host today. Uh, you may see him on the podcast from time to time. I'm kind of excited about that, getting him on the, the, the program. Uh, Brian's been doing this a long time. He worked at the very first computer store in the world in the 1970s, worked for Apple from the Apple II days all the way through Newton, did Ruby on Rails for a decade, and has been an Infinite Red core team member for the last couple of years. Brian now lives in Portland from the Apple II to React Native, not much has changed, right, Ryan? Uh, pretty much not. I, you know, I drop off my punched cards at the end of the day and hopefully get my, <laughs> al- my output the next morning and everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love uh, having Brian around. And you on the podcast cannot see this, but he just held up a punch card. <laughs> I kid you not on, on Zoom here where we all are. This is fantastic. Brian brings a lot of uh, perspective to what we're doing here. You know, there's, there's a lot of new stuff in, the, in, the, in technology, of course. But there's some things that have been around for a long time, and it's great to have them with us. But it's not just us hosts, but we we also have a special guest today, and that is Brent Vatney. Now, Brent has actually been on the program, but it's been a long time ago. 2015 was the last time that he was on React Native Radio, and that was prior to Infinite Red taking over, which was more recently. Brent is a developer at Expo, a core contributor to React Native, primary maintainer of React Navigation. He lives in the other Vancouver the one in Canada that you may know, also know as Gastown. I, I was waiting for Brent's expression <laughs> on that one, Gastown. <laughs> have, have you ever heard that Vancouver used to be called Gastown? I know we have an area called Gastown that is a, like a popular neighborhood for tourists, but I didn't know that people actually called it Gastown. <laughs> <laughs> that was its original name before you stole it from us. Yeah, well, so, okay, uh, yeah, yeah uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> we both live in Vancouver, so that's that's kind of fun. But yeah, uh, so Brent is is awesome. Brent's been around for a long time in the React Native community, and actually spoke of the first Chain React as well, which is where I where I met him. So I'm I'm very excited to have Brent on the program. Before we go into that, this episode is sponsored by Infinite Red. Infinite Red is a premier React Native design and development agency located fully remote in the USA and Canada. With years of React Native experience since it was released and deep roots in the React Native community, Infinite Red is the best choice for your next React Native app. Hit us up, hello at infinite.red. You can email me directly, jamin at infinite.red. And don't forget to mention that you heard about us through the React Native radio podcast. Also, Infinite Red is now hiring React Native engineers. If you're a senior level React Native engineer located in the US or Canada, go to careers.infinite.red and fill out the fancy new form that I made. It is very fancy. I, I tried it. Yeah. The only problem was I, I couldn't get uh, HTTPS to work. 
So I hope I fixed that before this episode comes out. Infinite Red, stealing all your data. <laughs> See, this is why we need more engineers. I actually think it's a problem with DNS simple. Anyway, let's get into our topic for today. Today, we're going to be talking about advancements in Expo. Brent, can you tell us a little bit of the history of Expo? How did it start? Who's Who are the founders? Why was it created? You know, sort of what's the mission? What what? Give us kind of a, an overview of what Expo is all about. I'll give you the short version. Um, so it was founded by uh, Charlie Cheever and James E. Day. Um, this was back around 2014. They were kind of exploring it as a kind of way to improve the state of mobile development. Charlie was previously working on Quora, where he was responsible for leading the teams and building the mobile apps. And he was a co-founder at Quora and I guess had a lot of uh, experience working with the product from from the start. And so he kind of went from working on the website to working on the mobile app and found it to be extremely painful in comparison to working on the website. And then once he released the iOS app, he found that building the Android app was not as easy as you would expect from having already completed uh, the iOS app, or at least not as easy as you would expect as as a web developer without kind of experience in that that area. And so after his time at Quora ended, he kind of spent some time just learning more about the mobile space and exploring that and got together with James to try and figure out like what they could do to improve the state of cross-platform mobile development. And they were actually building something similar to React Native at the time that React Native was released. And I think they cleverly identified, well, why should we build this thing totally separately? Let's just combine efforts with with this other project since they were already big fans and, and users of, of React.js on the web. So that that's kind of how it started off. The project itself has changed a lot over the years. We had kind of a focus towards originally building sort of a browser for native apps. Um, and due to, of course, limitations on um, certain platforms with certain companies, <laughs> you are not always able to to do everything that you might want to do um, when distributing an app, uh, such as a, an app browser on, on the App Store. And so that model has essentially gone away and we're entirely focused on enabling developers to build cross-platform apps as quickly and like with high quality and and like work on teams and basically all of the great things that you would like to have when building a mobile app. We're just trying to identify all of those pain points and all the areas where we can make things better and and kind of try to handle that accidental complexity of, of building these apps for developers where possible and make everyone more productive. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't actually know that uh, Charlie and James had their original idea there was to actually build something like React Native. That's that's kind of an interesting angle that I hadn't heard before. I think it's similar to how Charlie at, at Quora had built something similar to React at the time. And so it's sort yeah. of, you know, ideas, I think a time comes for an idea and multiple people kind of build this similar sort of thing at the same time. And then ultimately one or two or however many solutions the, the marketplace can support and end up rising to the top and uh, having some staying power. Yeah. I see Expo as being very much a kind of a layer on top of React Native that it's a layer of services. It's a layer of technology. It's a layer of even like just service and support on top of React Native that that really doesn't exist otherwise. You can obviously hire a consultancy, obviously, you know, we're a consultancy, but in terms of having that kind of productized, uh, yeah. that's what Expo does. And, and it's a really cool concept. I'm glad Expo exists. I'm glad it's existed from su- such an early time in the React Native world. One of the things that I've really enjoyed is that Expo has been an advocate for the community within the React Native core team throughout all of this. And I think that's a really important thing because your customers are us. Right. You're, that's that's who you're trying to you know right. support. And because of that, you have a very strong voice within the React Native core team. Yeah. How did that come about? Like, at what point did Expo and React Native start to be pretty pretty entwined because i mean you see a lot of expo references in the react native official docs how did that relationship sort of start to form really early on i actually met charlie and james the co-founders um 
because we were all contributing to React Native. And back in the earliest releases, um, open source releases of React Native, both James and I were responsible for writing the release logs and you know putting together the releases and publishing them and so on. And so we we worked together and, and met up and eventually decided to start working together on on Expo or Exponent as it was called at the time. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> uh, I was against the name change originally, but now I, I can't imagine why we would have stuck with Exponent. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah. So we we're working a lot with the React Native core team at, at Facebook through uh, our contributions, and at one point. A topic came up of like there were, there was someone at Facebook who who wanted to improve the time to hello world of of React Native mm -hmm. um, because you go to the React Native documentation and then it says all right well like basically it didn't say this but it might as well have said okay I hope you have a few hours because you're going to need to download uh -huh. Xcode and you're going to need to if you want to run on both platforms also <laughs> download Android Studio and and do all this other stuff and <laughs> and like that's that's fine I mean that that's kind of like what you have to do to sometimes get tools working. But we wanted to explore, like, is there a way that we could work together to bring that time to Hello World down, you know, to something in, in the order of minutes rather than an hour or multiple hours if you're on a slow connection or unfamiliar with the tools. Um, and so we built something that was slightly different from Expo, but like basically using a lot of the same infrastructure called Create React Native App. Um, with mm -hmm. with the, mm. the blessing of Facebook, and we announced that at uh, React Conf, I don't twenty seventeen maybe I, I can't remember anymore. No, and kind of started using that in the documentation as as a way to get started. And sort of over time, we moved away from from that package as the entry point, primarily because it was a little bit confusing for people, um, where they would say, okay, I ran create React Native app, and then I got this like Expo project, and we were having to maintain multiple versions of like very similar code base um, with, between Expo CLI and, and create React Native app. So we just kind of condensed that into Expo CLI and updated the documentation accordingly. And um, I think a big reason why that was possible was that one of the reasons we put create React Native app there in the first place instead of Expo CLI was we wanted to keep the doors open in case some other company like Expo came along and wanted to provide a similar service and create React Native app was meant to be kind of agnostic about what tool you use within that that context. And so there could be multiple sort of development client apps if that was something that someone else wanted to do. But uh, ultimately, nobody came along and did that. I'm not surprised. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so we, we moved towards Expo CLI there. Yeah, that's a little bit of a sneak peek into Expo's culture. And I've been around you folks for over five years now. And I, I can attest to this. You have an, a kind of a unique internal culture where you're very open. You're very, you, you're not, I, I don't even know how to say this really uh, very well, but it's, it's basically like you embrace competition, you embrace other mm. alternatives, you talk about why you might not use Expo. Mm. And I think that there's some really cool things that come out of that because at the end of the day, you will stand on the things that you're good at and you're not going to hide the things you're not good at, yeah. you're going to say, this is why you would use Expo. This is why you would, you know, yeah. why you would not use Expo. Yeah. And I've always really appreciated about that about your team. Uh, that's a hard thing to maintain over time as you grow because the pressure from, you know, just building a business is, is the other direction sure. is to like, okay, let's trumpet our strengths <laughs> and hide our weaknesses. Um, but yeah, I've always really appreciated that. And We'll, we'll probably talk about this further into the podcast, but one of the things we did with our CLI, Ignite, which spins up a boilerplate, sounds like it overlaps with, with Expo. The reality is that it now works with Expo. You can use Expo or you can use the regular React Native CLI. In some ways, it kind of fit, fits that original vision of, of what you were going for with create, create React Native app where it can kind of hit either direction. Yeah. And I really like that 
But we like Expo so much that even if you spin it up not using Expo, you still end up with some Expo parts in your app because they work they work well even outside yeah. of Expo. And that, again, goes back to the culture. You're not going to keep all of the good stuff for yourself. You're going to actually share that with the community. Yeah. And historically, I guess for most of Expo's history, it hasn't been possible to use a lot of the SDK packages in um, in sort of vanilla React Native apps. And that wasn't because we didn't want to do it. It was just that it was very difficult when you're coming from the perspective of building a client that is kind of this monolithic mm -hmm. tool that has a kind of fixed native runtime and you can have interdependencies between modules um, and, and get certain benefits um, from writing code in that way. And then to, so we kind of started from that approach, um, but to kind of like, split that out it, it was a lot of work and it took us a while to get there and so um you know it was, it was something we, we wanted to do but it just wasn't the the top priority i think that was probably a mistake and it should have been a top priority from the start because we ended up i think creating more divergence than we would have liked in the ecosystem with things like uh react native camera um at one point mm -hmm. they kind of wanted mm -hmm. to sync with the expo implementation and so they just copy and pasted the expo code base and then renamed a bunch of things and then, and then started working on that in, in parallel. So it just ended up being like us working on our patches for Expo Camera and they're working on a, like a now a separate stream of, oh, wow. of Expo Camera. And so, um, it was, it wasn't the best, uh, outcome, I think in, in some cases. And, uh, we're still trying to make that as, as good as it can be. But. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a great experience with unimodules and it was actually one of my first introductions to sort of the Expo ecosystem. And it was, it was a, a great way to sort of see all of the, the cool stuff that Expo can do while still being in our sort of normal vanilla React Native yeah. uh, world. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, this <laughs> Expo thing is really cool because I've seen what all the different unimodule pack packages can do. Let me back up a second for our audience here. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to attempt to explain how Expo works. Brent, you go ahead and correct me in any way that I'm wrong sure. here. So from my understanding, how this works is you spin up basically a JavaScript project here. You've got a JavaScript project. You don't have the iOS folder. You don't have the Android folder. The native stuff isn't on your computer. Now, when you run the project, otherwise it looks kind of like a React Native app. Like you've got, you know, an app entry point and, and you can write JSX and you can use TypeScript and you can do all these things that you would normally do in a React Native project. When you run yarn start, it spins up a packager similar to how the normal React Native app would work. And then you have your Expo app on either your simulator or on your device. And it installs that JavaScript package instead of into like my app or pizza app or whatever else you're building, it installs it into Expo app, like the Expo app that you built. Mm -hmm. And Expo already has all these kind of native bindings inside of it that where it knows how to talk to your code. It doesn't have to, they're, they're like prepackaged already. Mm -hmm. Now I know that some of the stuff is changing. We're going to be talking about that, uh, but this is essentially how this works so far. What that means is that you don't have to have Xcode. You don't have to have a, a Android studio. You just have to have a device that can take that JavaScript bundle and have that app on it. And then it'll start running. Is that correct? More or less? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what we call the managed workflow. Um, and, we call it managed because we manage the iOS and Android native side for you and you just write mm -hmm. JavaScript code. And so the, the Expo app on your phone, um, we call it Expo Go. Uh, it used to be called Expo Client, but renamed it to Expo Go for some reasons we can discuss a little bit later. Um, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, once you start a, a, a server, you run Yarn Start or NPM Start or Expo Start um, inside of your project, you we start up a an instance of uh, of Metro Bundler, and then we add some middleware for an Expo server in there, and that server uh, serves up a manifest file that describes things like what's the splash screen, app icon, and name of the app, and so on. And so when you when you scan the QR code that pops up, or if you open the Expo Go app and uh, open the app directly from there, because it will be pre-populated based off of knowing that like mm -hmm. you're signed into your Expo account on your computer, you're signed in on your phone, so. We can connect you to this. Uh, when you do that, we download this manifest and display this loading screen. And 
uh, and then start downloading and loading the bundle. And yeah, that's that's the basic idea. And this. Yeah, and the brilliance of that is you don't have to be compiling uh, native code. You don't have to have Android Studio. You don't have to have Xcode. And that's a really big advantage when you're really trying to get started. There are some other advantages as well. And we did a project recently at Infinite Red where we used Expo. And I want to talk about that. But I also want to cover Unimodules, which Robin mentioned. Unimodules is essentially a step toward making modules that work with Expo and with vanilla React Native, where you can use it on either of those. Now, you do have to install a small package called Expo or just Unimodules, I guess, Unimodules core. Yeah. And then once you've installed that, then you have access to Expo third-party packages or Expo uh, libraries. What we really liked about that wasn't just that we could use it on Expo apps and React Native apps. That was great. But the quality is great. You, mm-hmm. you folks do a really good job with your with your libraries. And that's that's something that can be, you know, outside third-party modules are varying quality in the React Native space. But we always know Expo uh, packages are going to be well done. Yeah, I think another nice thing that you get from using a like set of modules like like the S- Expo SDK provides is that there are consistent API conventions. And, um, and so you mm-hmm. know if there's an async function, it's going yeah. to be using an async suffix. We're going to use promises wherever possible. Uh, everything is written in TypeScript. Um, we kind of had very yeah. similar sort of documentation between each of the modules. And so uh, there's something nice about having that consistency in, in across the libraries that you use, for sure. Totally. Yeah, we really appreciated that. It was nice while we were building when we came across a need for a third party service for whatever it was geolocation yeah. maps camera whatever like oh expo has one like yeah. has something for that and you know it's going to be well documented you know what to expect yeah we were worried that uh, we'd need, discover a need to eject from the the managed environment which is it's great that expo provides that if you if you run into something where you have to install a dependency that you know, has a native uh, a native component. Uh, you can eject from the managed environment and turn your app into a vanilla React Native app and continue developing. Yeah. We were worried we'd have to do that, uh, but never did, and it just worked out great. I mean, yeah. the, we used this project as a way to build Expo support into our Ignite boilerplate. Uh, that worked out really well. We did get close one time. Remember, Brian? Uh, we <laughs> we we were working on a feature of the app where because it was a two sided marketplace app. And we needed to integrate Stripe Connect. So normal Stripe, like you can use normal Stripe in Expo just fine. No problem. But Stripe Connect didn't have like full support, at least at that time. And so we were looking at like, okay, do we do we eject? And do we work around it? We, we had a long discussion about that. We ended up using the non-React Native libraries for Firebase and for Stripe. The, the web libraries work just fine. So that worked out fine. Because they're JavaScript. Yeah. So that was an interesting thing. And and we, this was, you know, because we were doing this, this was our first fully, full, like managed project in Expo. This was a bit of an experiment. And I did, I hit up Brent a few times. Brent is awesome about responding to me on Twitter, even though I probably should be using official channels and stuff, but I just <laughs> DM him. <laughs> He's awesome. Uh, but I would ask him things and he would very... uh uh, nicely point me to the docs or do whatever. And uh, th- it's, it's fantastic uh, having that sort of a resource as, as help. Uh, we, we paid for the managed service to get prioritized, uh, prioritized builds at the time and whatnot. It was, it was a good experience overall. There were some points where it was a little like, Ooh, you know, what do we do? Especially if it came to a point where we needed something with, with native code. And we're going to be talking about something new that Expo is working on that solves that problem. Before we get there, I, I want to mention that a couple of years ago, I met with with your team and just kind of talked about our use cases. And one of the things I said, if uh, you can remove the pain around React Native upgrades, which was a real pain at the pro- at the time, it's, it's, it's gotten a lot better since then, but it's still kind of an issue. Uh, that would be amazing. And also, uh, you know, just there's just a myriad of just small cuts that you kind of run into <laughs> with with React Native, and if you can just make that experience better, then you know I, I'd be a, I'd be a customer for sure. I've I've said for a long time that I think Expo is the future of of React Native, but with this new stuff coming, I feel like it's starting to become more the present. So I would like to shift more into EAS. Brent, would you tell us what EAS is? Sure. So 
we kind of split up Expo as a company into two categories. There's the Expo platform, which is the SDK, like we talked about before, like the various modules that, that we provide for access to native capabilities. There's the client, so Expo Go to open your app in development and things like Expo CLI. Um, there's also Snack for loading you know, small sandboxes in the browser to play around with. Um, Snack is really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And then we have the uh, services side of the business. So the Expo platform side is is totally open source and everything in it is completely free to use and you can fork it and do whatever you want with it. The services side is uh, largely closed source, although there is an open source component to it. Um, and maybe before we talk about the specifics, uh, I think a, a key thing to, to identify here is that even though it's like a set of hosted services that, you know, it's a business, they're a paid offering. There's also a free tier and there's also no lock-in. So these services, you can mm -hmm. run them on your own CI if you want to. You don't have to use our hosted servers for that. Um, and so the part of it that is closed source is just like our server that like run, integrates it into our, our website and dashboard and so on. But if you want to like run our build service on your own CI server, mm -hmm you can just install the CLI tool and use the same thing that we use to do that. Um, and so, yeah, we, we definitely want to not get people feeling like they're locked in whatsoever and that they have full ability to take their app wherever they want to and, and, and so on. So these services, uh, we have a couple of them so far. I mean, we have the, like what we call now the classic services, which uh, what are what you've used in the past. So like, uh, Expo yeah. Build. So from the Expo CLI, you'd run Expo Build iOS, and that would uh, create a build of your JavaScript bundle and uh, upload all of your assets and uh, create a manifest and then start a native build on one of our servers that would um, take all of that and put it inside of a binary and apply all of the necessary uh, changes to it and then upload that binary somewhere so that you can then download it and uh, Upload it to the App Store or Play Store, whatever you need to do. And then there's a you know an update service, so for publishing over the air updates, um, and as well one for notifications. And so what's happening now with uh, EAS is we kind of ran into limitations with our classic services, um, specifically around build, um, but there there are uh, limitations really in in all of them that have required us to revisit uh, kind of the the. Uh, initial design. Um, and so around build, the main limitation is that we kind of use a very optimized approach to building that was not flexible enough to solve the problem that um, you nearly ran into when <laughs> using Expo at Infinite Red <laughs> of wanting to add your own native code to the project. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the way that that worked was basically we have a pre-built um, unsigned uh, archive sitting uh, in a tar file that we then download on our build service and go through and rename all of these strings in, in the file and uh, copy over all of the assets and copy in your JavaScript bundle. And then we sign that and then give it to you. And so this is not the standard compilation process. And that's how on iOS, we're able to do a build of your app in something like a minute or a minute and a half. Um, because it, it's just copying resources over and, and changing strings. And so that's great for doing fast builds where you have a fixed native runtime, but it doesn't work so well when you actually need to compile the app from scratch. And that's a very different problem because rather than uploading your assets and JavaScript bundle and manifest, you now need to upload your entire project somewhere. So you would need to like mm -hmm. with CI, often you you know connect your Git repo or something like that. You now need to pull in that entire project. You need to install CocoaPods and you need to run Gradle and Fastlane and, and whatever else you're doing in that context. To complicate things a little bit further, in managed apps, you don't have an iOS or Android directory. And so we have to create those <laughs> on, on the fly in order to then do a build. So it's fundamentally a, a different approach to doing builds than our classic build service, um, which is really driven by the need to support native code in managed apps. The ability for people to yeah. say, well, I would like to use the Stripe Connect uh, React Native plugin in my app. 
Um, and that's not something that's part of the like preset expo uh, SDK runtime, but I'm going to install it and then do a build and it will be there. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the, the direction that ES build is headed in where uh, we rebuilt our build infrastructure, lots of use of the word build there, but I hope that's clear enough. <laughs> uh, and it kind of made it into something that much more closely resembles your standard mobile CI, CD kind of infrastructure. It's You get access to uh, a machine in the cloud that um, is, it, it knows how to build your React Native app. It knows how to build your um, Expo Manage app and tries to take care of as much of that as it can for you, but you still get uh, the full power and customizability of of doing a full proper native build rather than kind of using this uh, this pre-built app and, and modifying it. So we have a couple of other services as well, and one of them is uh, submission. So we've found in the past that it's been a limitation for people where you can use Expo Manage Workflow to build an iOS app on Windows because you just need to be able to run Node on your machine and have an iOS device to uh, test on, but you don't actually need to have a, a Mac to do the development. And so um, our submission service is a hosted way to upload your app to Apple. So you can run ES submit once you've done a build with uh, ES build and from any CI server or from your Mac or Windows or Linux machine, um, submit to the App Store. And we kind of try and provide a nice experience around that with giving you uh, better context for errors that pop up and try and help you with fixing those and and overall more, more guidance there. Um, and there's some other stuff I could talk about, but that's the most interesting probably. Yeah, so it sounds like you're really aiming to be sort of a an all-encompassing one-stop shop. Does that mean you kind of see Expo replacing the sort of go-to build tools that a lot of people use now, like Fastlane and Match and Test Flight for for beta builds and those kinds of tools? I think ES Build and Expo, like we fit in nicely with those. In terms of um, Fastlane, we actually use Fastlane by default in our build process. Um, to build the iOS app, we use mm -hmm. Fastlane Gym and you can customize your gym file. Um, that's the approach that, that we take to allow you to customize your builds further. Um, and for a test flight, we provide something called an internal distribution, which is similar to um, what you might get with, with other tools like App Center or Firebase app distribution uh, that basically allows you to manage an ad hoc certificate or ad hoc provisioning profile rather and add some list of devices to it and then do a build and distribute to those devices. Um, but that's, that's not always an, a good alternative for test flight. I think test flight has for example, higher number of devices that you can distribute to. So with like ad hoc provisioning, you can only distribute to up to 100 devices. Uh, whereas test flight, I think it's something like 10,000. Um, mm -hmm. And but, but there are trade offs there. And so I think generally it, it kind of fits in with those. And, and it's more of a an alternative for tools that that just work out of the box with with React Native and with Expo projects. And maybe another good example is something like Fastlane Match for credentials. Um, you still kind of have mm -hmm. to set that up. You need to create your app signing credentials and then store them somewhere and teach Fastlane about how to get those and um, allow you to synchronize those between machines. Um, whereas using ES for this, we we help you generate those credentials on your own. We store them, and then anyone that's a part of your team on the Expo dashboard uh, is able to then build using those credentials, provided they have sufficient permissions to do so. Wow, yeah. So that really is like everything all wrapped into one. That's pretty cool. Uh, do you see anything changing uh, in in the way you support the runtime environment? Right now, you, you, you've got a back end for doing notifications that apps use. Our last app used it and it worked great. Are there other you know sort of runtime components you see yourself building for the back end of, of native apps? Yeah, I would love to get into in-app purchases and really make that flow as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that people have wanted for a long time <laughs> in Expo Manage apps. <laughs> and I think that it's not super easy to do, especially not like in a cross-platform way. And I, I think that would be really interesting for us to get into that once we get ES build in, into a state where we can allow people in the managed workflow to use 
um, any custom native modules uh, because we can't actually include any code around in-app purchases in our App Store distribution of Expoco. And so mm -hmm. a big part of being able to support uh, custom native code in managed apps is to allow developers to build their own version of Expo Go. And so that was what I was alluding to earlier. The, um, the rename from Expo Client to Expo Go was intended to describe that Expo Go is kind of the, the way to get started. And it's this preset runtime that I think will work well for a lot of people and a lot of smaller apps. But at some point, um, you might want to include something like Stripe Connect or in-app purchases. And then you can do your own custom build of the Expo client and um, and include your own bespoke native runtime that you're then building against. That that kind of approach is, is necessary to do this, but we we absolutely want to expand to other other things like in-app purchases. Yeah. That'd be very cool. With EAS, does it handle both sort of normal Expo apps and ejected apps, or how does that work? You have to use one or the other. Well, I would say that like a, a normal Expo app, just to clarify, is like, and it's an ejected app or a managed app. But we we treat them both as being um, totally valid ways to use the tools. And some people mm -hmm. like to work in an environment where they don't have to deal with the iOS and Android projects at all. Other people are more comfortable when they can at any point drill down and do any sort of uh, work that sure. they need to do in native code. And um, so ES build actually currently only has some early experimental support for managed apps and it works great for mm -hmm. uh, you know any React Native app. You can run NPX React Native init or you can you know ignite new and and like mm -hmm. you immediately in that project run ES build and hit enter a couple times and type in your Apple credentials and, and you'll have an app building that you can then upload to the store right away. And so it it works with really um, any React Native project and it, it could mm. potentially work with any native project as well, but we're really focused on specifically React Native and Expo projects. That's mm -hmm. where we think we can uh, differentiate from other mobile CI CD services where you know we're, we're building this, this tool chain that people use in development, but we're also building the end-to-end -end experience. Um, and throughout the entire um, process, we're considering React Native and Expo as being the tools that people are using. And so if you're using Expo CLI right. for development, if you're using packages in your, your SDK, uh, in the Expo SDK in your project, um, you know, React Native packages as well, like these are all things that we can optimize to, for example, speed up your builds or, um, kind of just provide you with good defaults around like having options in your configuration to uh, customize like Expo updates out of the box and and that sort of thing. So kind of really deeply integrating this uh, idea of a mobile CI CD service with React Native and Expo and kind of seeing how far that can go is, is the idea here. Interesting. So in a way you are, you're really supporting the kind of I guess you say you call it bear workflow uh, side of things. You're emphasizing that even more than you did before, where uh, it, you always supported it really well, but you're making it so that this is actually something that, I mean, you can provide services around. You can provide more than just the tooling around it. You can provide a yeah. lot of lot of other processes. I mean, to me, like I'll just give my opinion as someone who has only worked on an Expo project for maybe a month, you know, like <laughs> scattered throughout the project that uh, Robin, Brian, and I worked on. But I did really like not having to deal with Xcode or Android Studio. I really liked the managed workflow. To me, it was like working in a browser. It was like, you know, command R and it would refresh, you know, like it was just, you didn't have to think about it too much. I do really like that side of things, but I also understand the limitations and the fact that people kept running into these situations where they'd have to choose between you know, do I get like Expo's awesomeness or do I jump out of it and kind of don't get as much of that anymore? So you're, you're making it so that when you jump out, you're not jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. You actually have some good services around that. Yeah. And that, that was an issue in the past was um, when people would eject their projects, they would now lose access to running their builds on Expo build. Um, and that, that wasn't great because already you're taking on this additional complexity of managing the, the native projects. And now you have to also 
figure out again what your build pipeline is going to look like <laughs> and yeah and so that was something that was important for us to solve um to be able to continue to provide the same experience whether you have the native projects in in your source control or not and we're we're working towards a point with the eject command where it will just work perfectly in you know every situation essentially and you know sometimes mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit tricky right now we there there's a lot of uh sometimes manual work that needs to be done to set up some modules that are um included mm -hmm. in 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 your project for example um you might have to modify like your build gradle to add a maven repository if you're using a camera library for example um and mm -hmm. little things like this or modify your your main application or app delegate to add a little bit of code in order to initialize a module that you're using and so these sorts of things were just like chipping away at those making it so that um, we have a generic infrastructure for people to build on top of so that you know any of these these libraries if you're using something in the react native ecosystem that that we didn't even build it's it's very easy to plug in a well a plugin that, that will know how to configure a project when when you eject so that it just works right away and ultimately then the difference between like a a managed project and a bare project will just be whether you ran eject or not and then if you, if you like you can just like delete the ios and android directories and go back to being a managed project um so you might even do that for Debugging, if you you find like I really like using the managed workflow, but I'm not able to do something that I want to do in debugging right now. I need access to Xcode for it. So then you can eject, do whatever debugging you need to do. Go, oh, okay, this seems to be an issue with this library, or um, you know, you profile something and see this this particular animation is problematic. Then you just revert that, and and you're back to to working. Uh, without using Xcode and Android Studio. That's really great. Do you think uh, you'll be doing anything to improve the debugging experience, sort of the other end of the, the, the development flow? Yeah. Is there, I'm not sure if you have any ideas on how to improve that. Um, yeah, I I think we'd like to get into that. Um, I, I'm still, I think, looking to see how React Native tackles this with you know the Hermes debugger and whether we end up I know on Android, the plan is to get rid of JSC entirely at some point and move over to Hermes. So if, if that's something that ends up happening on iOS as well, I think right now there with React Native 64, I think a lot of people are going to be testing the waters with Apple and, and how open they are to people using Hermes instead of the uh, mm -hmm. built in JSC API. Um, and if that's something that Apple seems okay with, then maybe in the future, React Native could switch over to Hermes and then we get Hermes debugger everywhere and, and that would be great. Um, mm -hmm. Ultimately, with with the new architecture and with turbo modules, like it seems like the debugging experience needs something like that. Like with if you include um, reanimated uh, in reanimated two in your app currently using JSC, which is uh, not possible outside of Expo currently, but it it uh, it is possible mm -hmm. in in Expo apps, then you can't use the Chrome debugger because of the synchronous calls and, and various things that are incompatible with uh, with using a Chrome debugger. And so that I think that's kind of the direction it'll go. And we're at the moment not investing in uh, working on the de debugger as we have a bunch of other stuff to, to do, but uh, pretty optimistic about what Facebook is doing around around Hermes, and we hope that'll be a good answer for people. It's worth uh, noting that our debugging tool, Reactatron, works great with Expo. Yeah. And if people, <clears throat> because it is just a JavaScript side thing, uh, you can you can use Reactatron to debug like your state and get logs and inspect network requests and whatnot. Flipper is another debugging tool that, re that Facebook released. Yeah. I don't think it works with the managed workflow, is that right, right. Brent? Or, but it, it works with the other? Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you can only use it to the extent that it provides access to React Dev tools inside of Flipper. But in terms of mm. like the native yeah. hierarchy uh, debugger and things like that, that's stuff that uh, is not available right. currently. Um, yeah, I, I think that's something interesting. But will be with EAS, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it it depends, I guess. Uh, EAS. Yeah. You, you could potentially, like, we're, we're actually in building this new version of the Expo client. Um, really, we're, we're building that also from scratch. 
And um, we'll have a, a preview yeah. out for that soon that people can actually try in any React Native project. You can just install uh, this library in your mm -hmm. project and add a couple of lines of configuration to give it a try. But you could conceivably set up your project such that um, it works with Hermes um, using this, this other yeah. development client. Uh, and sorry, it works with Hermes and also works with uh, Flipper. Um, that's something that we just haven't uh, explored yet for the managed workflow. Yeah, this is this is awesome, and it's really cool to see the direction that Expo is taking. Uh, you know, like I said, Ignite's been using or it, it allows Expo, and so we've been really paying attention to what you folks are doing. When there are new projects coming in, new startups, we always evaluate whether whether Expo makes sense in that particular case. It sounds like with EAS uh, Expo Application Services, when it when it is kind of fully available, that we are going to have that option even with you know, pretty, pretty customized apps. So that's, that's great news for us. We, we really like what you all are doing over there. I've always believed in your team. It seems like it's always good, good code and good decisions kind of coming out of that. You have had kind of this evolving thing, and I'm sure that you have a lot of, I don't know, stories of, of backflips you've had to do to make some of this stuff work. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see for sure. Yeah. If people want to want to read more about EAS, there is a blog post about that. I'll link to it in the show notes so that uh, I think, Brent, you actually wrote that blog post uh, that introduces EAS and they can get a, a good sense for what's coming down down the road. Yeah. And uh, we'll be releasing our first update blog post maybe within the next week or so about um, the improvements that we've made to EAS since the release, um, the preview release in December. And we're targeting yep. the end of Q1 for releasing full managed workflow support. So that, nice. that's exciting. It's something to keep an eye out for. Very cool. So we're going to go to the next section of the program. And this is where we talk about weird bugs. So from what I understand, Brian's got a weird bug that he wants to talk about. Brian, what do you got? Well, there's not actually a, a, a weird bug. It's kind of an ordinary bug, but it's a weird solution. I was upgrading this <laughs> app that we've been talking about, our uh, our first managed expo app mm -hmm. to SDK 40. And this app has a typical scrolling list of cards on its home screen. You tap on one of the cards that, that takes you to a detail screen. After upgrading to the new SDK, that tap would crash and restart the app, but only in Android production builds. And this is the first time I'd had to track down a production only bug uh, I found the tools are pretty limited. Uh, you know, ADB Logcat or whatever will show you the system Android system log that has some React Native stuff in it, but it's not console.log, and it's really noisy with unrelated stuff. And also production builds uh, through uh, Expo's wonderful service. Uh, we're, we're no longer on the paid priority build system, and they can take half an hour or longer, which, you know, when you're doing one a day, that's not so bad. But if you're trying to iteratively debug, that's painful. So... My first strategy was to start cutting out pieces of the app to see what made the crash go away. And I wasn't sure if the crash was something related to navigating from the old screen or rendering the new one. So I just made the detail screen render a single text element. And then I told Expo to do a new production build uh, so I could test it. And when I did that, Expo gave me a warning that the non-JavaScript parts of the build were the same as the existing build. And I could speed things up by using the over-the-air update mechanism, which is something we use routinely in our, in our publishing of the app to push out JavaScript-only uh, updates that uh, don't involve going through the app store. It's a, it's a great way to get new fixes to your customers. But I hadn't thought of using this in development to, to narrow down this bug. And it was great because that only takes like 30 seconds per iteration. So within three or four iterations, I'd track the problem down to a known issue with the little map component that we were using, uh, not liking our custom marker image. It isn't exposed map component. I don't know why we picked it. But anyway, the uh, the issue was Googleable. It's a known issue. It has an easy workaround and had the problem fixed. And it, it was just great to have that over the updates mechanism to, to speed my development. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, one of the things that is the most frustrating in debugging is when you have a slow feedback cycle. So mm -hmm. you try something and then you have to sit there and wait for <laughs> ages and ages and ages. That can be very frustrating. So finding a way to really speed up that cycle is, is awesome. I think uh, we can call that one a wrap. Uh, where can people find you, Robin, on Twitter? I'm at Robin underscore Hines with an E at the end. And Brian, where can people find you? I'm at Brian Stearns on Twitter at Brian with a Y and Stearns is S-T-E-A-R-N-S. -E Perfect. And Brent, uh, how can we find you on Twitter? I am not Brent on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were Brent. But, uh, <laughs> confusing. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, you can find me at Jamin Holmgren, and you can find React Native Radio at React Native RDIO. Thank you to our guest host, Brian Stearns, for joining us today, and our guest, Brent Batney. Next time, don't wait five years between uh, appearances. Hopefully, we'll <laughs> have you back on to talk about some other things in the future. As always, thanks to our producer and editor, Todd Worth, our transcript and release coordinator, Jed Bartoski, our social media coordinator, Missy Warren, and Justin Husky and Jenna Fucci, who are responsible for the React Native radio artwork. Thanks to our sponsor, Infinite Red. Check them out at infinite.red slash React Native. And also thank you to all of you listening today. Make sure to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. Look for React Native Radio and let other people know about this. Reminder, Infinite Red is hiring React Native engineers. If you're a senior level React Native engineer located in the US or Canada, go to careers.infinite.red and I will get that HTTPS error fixed soon, <laughs> I promise. See you all next time. Bye. Bye.